the five tribes of the Iroquois Confederacy, dependent on European goods, needed to secure the beaver trade in their favor. They needed to be the highway of beaver pelts to the Europeans, particularly the Dutch. And in order to secure this trade, they would need to eliminate dozens of Native American tribes between them and the interior of the continent where beaver pelts could still be found. If necessary, even the French would be pushed aside. And the fearless and ruthless reputation of the Iroquois would help them on their way to smash through the competition and build the great Iroquois Empire, becoming the Romans of the Americas. Wow, that sounds like an amazing story. Something I would see in the movie theater, perhaps. But is it true? And I'm going to spoil it right now. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say this might be part of the story, but this isn't the whole story. In the past, many historians have lumped together all these different conflicts the Iroquois had in the 17th century as beaver wars. Their main goal being to obtain beaver furs and secure access to future beaver furs. And that just isn't true. While obviously obtaining beaver furs was an economic motive, there was so much more going on. So if you're listening to this hoping to hear about a genuine beaver war, well, we've already covered it earlier in this series. The Mohawk-Mohegan War lasted from about 1624 to 1628, if my memory serves me correctly. That was over access to Fort Orange, over the beaver trade. That was a beaver war. This time frame that we're getting to now that's labeled the time of the beaver wars, not quite as simple as that. It's not, it's not as cut and dry. Now, before we move on, let's give the beaver war theory, I'm going to call it, or the beaver war construct, let's give it a little credit here. So, by the mid-1630s or so, the beaver were hunted out of New York State, basically. The area that the Haudenosaunee controlled, the Iroquois Confederacy, the, it, there were no more beaver around. So they had to look elsewhere for beaver in order to trade with the Dutch. And again, furs were about the only thing the Dutch wanted. So if you wanted those nice goods from Europe and everywhere else in the world, because the Dutch had access to all of that, you had to provide them furs. So there was that economic incentive there to obtain beaver furs. Instead of Native Americans going about their normal hunting patterns, this need for furs in Europe caused the Native Americans to change how they hunted, basically. There were certain animals that now they really wanted to get a hold of, like beaver, because the fur was very valuable and could be exchanged for goods that they otherwise couldn't get a hold of. What this caused was now the Haudenosaunee were hunting not only to feed themselves, but also for a profit. And now they started to see certain animals not the way they used to in the Native American view, but in the European view at the time that certain animals equal a certain amount of profit. And so the beaver became a commodity, and that commodity was quickly stripped out of the Haudenosaunee territory. So they did have to go elsewhere to get those furs. That's a little bit of evidence for the beaver war narrative. Now, if this doesn't accurately describe the time, then how did this narrative come about? This great century of wars over beaver furs. How did this develop and, and this idea that the Iroquois would grow into this fantastic empire? Well, this view seems to come about in the 19th century. Why this is important is because the European writers who are writing about the Haudenosaunee in the 19th century are living in the world of imperialism at the time. So this is going to be the height of the British Empire, but that's they're going to control basically a quarter of the world. And then the French are not too far behind. The Spanish Empire is dwindling, but still there. The Portuguese Empire, the Dutch have a lot. Russia expanded from Eastern Europe into Asia all the way over to Alaska. And we're going to cover that in a future season. By the end of the 19th century, the only places that weren't under some sort of imperial control or an imperial power themselves were South America, Central America, places like that, because they were under the Monroe Doctrine. The U.S. kind of protected those areas from being uh, taken over from European powers, although we did we did have a lot of influence over them. Some people say not so much positive influence. And then deep, deep parts of Africa, but even the European powers got to them eventually. And then even China. China was just so big that no one could really just take it over. They're so, so uh, populated, rather. So uh, even the European powers and the Japanese, they just carved up China into little spheres of influence. It would be like renting a piece of China for 20 years. That, that would be your sphere of influence. So most of the world is either a conqueror or the conquered. So the historians at the time, they see history through this lens. 
So when those 19th century historians making those big dusty books that you might still find in a library somewhere were writing about the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederacy, that's what they had going on in their head. So they pictured the Iroquois as this huge expansionist group of tribes that confederated together and due to the economic need that they had, they expanded outward and became the conquerors of the Native Americans. They were the ultimate, they were the best, they were the toughest, they were the meanest, they were the smartest, they were everything. And the Haudenosaunee, before this period, certain members of the Haudenosaunee anyway, they would brag and say things that would kind of support this argument. Of course, every group of people have those who will boast for them. But you and I, we're not living in the 19th century. Well, I know I'm, I, I'm, I'm living in the 21st century. If you're living in the 19th century, kill baby Hitler! So what do we know now that those historians were unaware of that changes the story so dramatically? And this is the point I've been building to. Disease. We now know that different plagues from the old world, most likely, in most cases, smallpox, but other ones too, caused the decimation of Native American populations. And the figures are all over the place, but basically it depends on which group and which time period. But anywhere you look, you're seeing numbers between 50 and 90%. 50 to 90% of every Native American tribe, the, the people in there, were wiped out by disease. These old world diseases, diseases that circulated through Europe and Asia and Africa and never made it over to North or South America. These people had been separated for 10,000 years from old world populations and they had no immunity to some of these diseases. So let's bring the point back around. Put yourself down in a Haudenosaunee village. Pick any tribe you want, any clan. Make, your, make yourself an identity, go ahead. Now you're sitting in your village. Let's take a span of 10 years. Well, you have access to Dutch trade now, so you have certain European goods. Makes your life a little easier, right? That's important and you wanna keep that going. And in order to do that, you're gonna to have to find furs that they find valuable. So that's one factor in your life. But listen to this factor in your life. So 10 years ago, you had 200 people in your village. Now, you have 20 people. You have 180 people who have died of disease. You are not a literate culture. The history and the stories and the knowledge of everything around you is held in these people. And now you've just reduced that number by 90%. That knowledge is gone forever unless somebody somewhere else holds that knowledge also. We're gonna pick up on that point later. So now think to yourself, which factor is going to be more important to your everyday life now? Obtaining European goods or dealing with the fact that 90% of everyone around you is dying of unknown diseases? To me, this puts the whole beaver war theory to bed. Because yes, <laughs> getting beaver pelts was important but the, the sheer catastrophic nature of these diseases would clearly be a more motivating factor for everything you would do in your life at this point. Now you may say to me, hey, well, what does this have to do with warfare? If a tribe is decimated so much, how could they even begin to conduct any sort of normal raiding or warfare in general? Well, if you listen to my previous episodes on the Haudenosaunee, you would probably already know the answer. So that's your fault for skipping around. The Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederacy, the Five Nations, whatever you want to call them, they had built into their culture a way to replace people who had passed away, either in warfare or, in this case, disease or just old age, your numbers are down, what, what have you. Captives could be taken, and if they were deemed desirable, they could be made part of your tribe, your clan. They could become your people. So the Haudenosaunee, they faced a scenario a lot of Native American tribes faced during this time when diseases were ravaging them. And again, these diseases showed up on the East Coast first, and then they'd make their way to each population in turn with contact with Europeans. Do we wither in number and just become irrelevant to the economy growing around us and kind of shrivel away? Do we in mass join the Europeans, convert and live their way? Do we join another tribe? and just get absorbed. All of those things happen to many Native American tribes. Again, after the diseases ravage areas, there are tribes that simply disappear. They're gone. And then there are other tribes where the name disappears, but 200 to 300 years later, we'll piece together that a part of this tribe over here actually is descendant 
from refugees from this tribe that hasn't existed for 300 years. The Iroquois are going to choose a different path. The Iroquois are going to obtain captives and make them Iroquois through a process I've already laid out in a previous episode. Again, you should listen to that one. That goes back way before the Europeans ever showed up. So it was already built into their culture. It was already there. And it ended up being kind of like a failsafe. Because if you look at the five nations today and the, the Tuscarora, you look at just the number of people who uh, claim to be of Iroquois descent, it's pretty large. Especially considering that a lot of the tribes around the Iroquois, some of them don't exist anymore. By, by some, I mean like half, I would say, don't even exist anymore. So the Iroquois are going to do something successfully here. So I have a number of different sources for the actual losses of life for the Iroquois specifically. And on average, I'm seeing basically by the 1640s, 75% of their population decimated. So if you're in a room of people right now, three out of four of you, gone. This in turn would actually create a greater need for European goods. All those skills and all that help that you would have had before, that's also going away. You would need these newer European inventions and materials in order to supplement the missing people in your life. But what if you could just replace those people? Well, we think of when we hear the word Iroquois, we think of the Five Nations. But there are so many more tribes at this time who are Iroquois people. They're just not part of the Iroquois Confederation. They're part of the Huron Confederation, which is actually larger in size in the early part of the 17th century than the Iroquois. There's more people there. So if you said, you know, in the year 1610, yeah, well, that huge confederation of Native Americans who speak Iroquois languages, the people might say, oh, you mean the Huron? So while you're sitting in your village and your brothers and your sisters and your clan are all dying, you have a replacement population. You are surrounded by tribes who aren't in your confederacy, so you can war with them. And they're not your brothers and sisters, but they're kind of like your cousins. Similar language, similar clan system, similar gender roles, so almost identical religious practices. Sim similar knowledge of how confederacies work, as I just mentioned. Also, the villages, nearly identical in design. These people, if you were looking to adopt some people, this is where you would go. And they're going to be ravaged by disease, too. But they're still going to have a, a, a little bit of remnant left over. They're still going to have that quarter or that tenth or that half. And those cousins could become your brothers and sisters. You could take two broken cultures and rebuild it into one stronger culture. And the Iroquois have a lot of cousins to pick from. Beyond their own five tribes, you have the Tuscarora down south. Really far away, actually, but much closer. You have a whole bunch of tribes in a confederation that, again, we call the Huron Confederation. You have all of those guys. You have the Petun, otherwise known as the Tobacco Nation. You have the Neutrals. You have the Wenro. You have a bunch of other little tiny tribes that we barely even know of but we know they're in the archaeological record. We don't even know what they called themselves that lived up in the St. Lawrence, for instance. To the south, you had this huge tribe called the Sesquanahenoc, who are also an Iroquois people. And if you're really desperate, you can go really far south. And believe it or not, the Cherokee are a very distant branch of the Iroquois family. So you got tons of cousins to pick from. And you know what? If you're desperate, beyond the Iroquois people who occupy the near inland of the North American continent, Along the coast, you have the Algonquin people, who are strangers to the Iroquois. They don't, they don't actually have a lot in common with one another, certainly not language. But the Algonquin tribes who've lived along the coast, they have been ravaged by these diseases for far longer. They've had way more communication with the European people. And usually they're not as organized. They're in a really desperate situation right now. So as bad as you have it as an Iroquois tribe, there's probably an Algonquin tribe not too far from you that you could very, very easily pick from. So this sets the stage. Your numbers are dwindling. You need people to hunt. You need people to get beaver furs. You need to trade with the Dutch. You need to maintain your own community and strength. And you have built into your culture a way to adopt people. And so this is going to start off what a lot of historians today call the mourning wars. So as much as they wanted beaver fur, they were more about how their family members had died. They're in mourning, not mourning time of day, mourning like the state of being in mourning when somebody dies. And they're looking to replace their loved ones with new people. Now you might say to yourself, nah, I think this was all about beaver fur and power. Maybe that's your mindset. Well, roughly the, in the 17th century, 
the Iroquois were roughly involved in 450 or so engagements, battles, uh, even little skirmishes, uh, quite a few. These numbers are according to uh, Brandau in his book, Your Fire Shall Burn No More. Absolutely indispensable on the subject. Came out in like 1989. Joseph Brandau, I think his name is. I should just have it in front of me, but I'm not, I'm not a professional, so there you go. Of these engagements, there were a lot of captives taken. So as much, the, the, the casualties weren't terribly high. Sometimes they were high, but also a lot of people were just taken. And another notable fact, and I think Brandau mentions this specifically, there's very few of any of these engagements that involve looting. So the Iroquois being the victor, going in and taking things, uh, specifically furs, that happened not that common at all. So of the 465 engagements, I'll, I'll dig up the card here, I don't even know. We're talking about, I think, 10, 10 instances of the Iroquois carrying off loot versus carrying away people. So if you think these wars were still fought over beaver, there's really no material evidence to show that. It, that was one factor. But the primary drive of a lot of these wars, not all of them, a lot of these wars appears to be growing your family, rebuilding your tribe, your clan. All right, enough of the rambling. Let's get into some of the details here. So in a previous episode, I believe the one on Iroquois culture, you'll find tons of stuff where I talk about how they conduct warfare and the meaning of it and the process and all of the different nitty gritty of that and some of the torture that's done then. And so I'm not going to cover all of that right now because you should have listened to it. Once again, listen to the other ones, because otherwise I just sound like a rambling idiot. Now, if you listen to those previous episodes, I might just sound like a regular idiot. So you're not gonna get all the details here. I already did it, but here's some details. <laughs> so what would happen is typically during a morning war scenario, inside of a tribe, they have different clans. The female leaders of those clans would decide that, hey, we're, you know, a couple dozen of our guys died or two people died or we're, we're down in numbers. We're missing our loved ones. The village is suffering as a whole, the tribe. It's time that we replenish. And so the leaders of the clan, they would go and they would go to the male side of things and they would find the toughest warriors, the most respected older chief. They would find individuals and say, hey, will you lead a war party to replenish our tribe, our clan specifically. And these matriarchs would give them gifts and it was it was an honor to be asked to carry this out because this, as much as this could help the tribe, a loss or even a win that was done in a particularly severe manner could have repercussions. You could have these tribes that you're going after now coming back at you in a sort of blood feud, which was extremely common. So yes, uh, on that subject, some of these matriarchs would be saying, you know, my uh, one a male member of my clan was killed by this tribe over here. I would like you to avenge his death by attacking that tribe. And that's a blood feud. That's a, a problem in all of history anywhere you go is the I kill one of your guys, you kill one of my guys. There's no ending to that. It's the Hatfield and McCoys. You can't get out of that cycle. Or as we see in the 17th century a lot for the first time, these old world diseases ravaging populations. We need more people. Let's pull in people. The chiefs that would lead these war parties, they would gather men to the center of the village. They would strike a war post and they'd raise up a little miniature army. Now each village and each clan in each village could conduct warfare as they pleased. You didn't need a tribe's permission. You didn't need the Confederacy's permission. So in the Confederacy and most confederacies, each tribe or each state is independent fully. So the Seneca, they're, they're not gonna go to war with the Mohawk under this confederacy, but they could conduct war with whomever they want. They don't need to ask permission. Now, that being said, the whole confederacy can go to war together if they want also. That'd be a really strong way to go about it. But the Haudenosaunee, as much as people like to talk about their government structure and the, the intricacies of it, there was still a lot of personal freedom. So your clan mother could say, it's time to replenish, it's time to go to war. And her and maybe some other matriarchs would make the decision with the male war chief that they pick. And that would be it. That would be all that would be needed to carry out some sort of raid or war party. When the war party was assembled, there'd be the celebration and they'd sacrifice a dog and they'd mark their marks on war posts that hopefully they would update when they came back with all their victories. And the women would follow them with all these supplies they gathered together to the end of the village and even a little further out past the, the fields of corn. And then the men would be on their way. 
Of course, now that we're talking about the 17th century, these men might have to go quite a far distance, further than they've ever gone before. So, we'll see over the decades, Iroquois warfare changes a little bit. If you go back to uh, the first engagement they had with Europeans, when the Mohawk came up against uh, Champlain, which I covered in a previous episode, and I think I have a snippet of it up on YouTube, you can check that out. They fought like Greeks in formation, like hoplites, with wooden armor and sticks and spears and everything, tight together in a tight formation, like a wall, a wall of wood that would just come at you. And of course, in a world of stone and bone and sticks, that's a pretty good defense. And we see very quickly, they learn how to do raiding, especially when they're raiding people who are already trading with the French before the Dutch roll in and offer trade to the Mohawk and the other Haudenosaunee. So they learn how to do quick raiding parties. And then after a while, they realize, okay, these guns, they're big, they're scary, but we can face these things. And they realize at a certain point that Europeans don't know how to shoot that well. Uh, if Europeans are trained on how to use guns, they're usually trained to shoot in a volley with a bunch of other people. You don't need to aim very well. You just all need to shoot in the general direction at the same time to create a wall of bullets or bu musket balls, basically, at this time. The, the thing is, we have Europeans over here in the New World now, but they're not in big groups. Like Champlain had two of his buddies. It's three guys. Can't really do a volley with three guys at any good distance. So the Native Americans realized, well, if you're going against muskets, instead of being in one bunched together group with wood shields spread out, the guy with the musket now has to aim at that one guy. And again, they're not trained to shoot at one guy. So the Iroquois, they adapt like nobody else does. So you can usually trick them once or twice, but by that third time, they know what to do. Another thing that they have to do now is they're conducting war at longer and longer distances. So now they're realizing we have to have a store of food and they would make secret little caches of food along the way. And sometimes even they would build little forts and larger forts along the way in case they lose them, they have to fall back. And so we see this supply trail, a, a primitive idea of a supply chain being built up along the way. And it was better than having nothing. All right, let's switch roles. And again, I cover this in a previous podcast, but let's get to the, to the life of a captive or torture victim, basically. If you were captured by an Iroquois brave, the first thing that would happen is your hands would be bound or your legs sometimes would be bound, but you need to travel. They would do something to you so that it wouldn't be so easy for you to run away. That's the basic idea. Now, if you're gonna be taken as a captive, they're not gonna just mutilate you right away, but they might do some small tortures. For instance, if they can just tie your legs or make it so you have a bit of a limp, you could still walk, but there's no way you're going to get away from these young, healthy braves. Now, in general, there'd be three groups of people that you might find yourself apart as. So the Iroquois, eventually you're going to get separated into different groups. Some of you people are going to be tortured and that's tortured to death. So you don't want to be in that group. Then there's the other group that they're like, we're probably going to adopt these people. That's the group you want to be in. And then there seems to be a middle group where they don't know what we're going to do with you. So typically, if you're a young, young kid, male or female, you're going to be in the adopted group. Now, if you're an adolescent male, maybe adopted, you have a chance. Uh, it probably depends on your disposition. And if you're a female of any age, good chance you'll be adopted. So those are the, those are the groups where you're going to be okay-ish. But if you were an adult man, mm, you're there's a you're going to be the most populated pe group of people in that torture kill group. That's just how it's going to be. Now, in our modern mind, you could still go, OK, I, I can understand why that would be. I can understand why the women and children would be saved and the men who are old in a fighting age would not. But the Iroquois had an additional reason for wanting to save, especially the women. Remember, when the women were adopted into clans, when the women have children, those children will now be members of that clan. So if you were a clan that wanted to rebuild itself or maybe become more populated than other clans in your village, you wanted women. You needed more women. You needed captive women because all their children are going to be in your clan. If you take on a guy, if you take on a man, that's fine. He'll be part of your clan, but his kids are going to be part of whatever clan his wife belongs to. So you want women, you want the female captives. So let's go through these captives, luckiest to unluckiest. Now, when you're brought to a village, 
the people of the village, the women, the children, everybody, the braves who just came back, the men who never left, everybody lines up, two lines, right, facing each other, and you have to walk between them. This is the gauntlet, and they're going to have various things to hit you with, and you have to make it through that gauntlet to prove your strength. Now, again, if you're in the luckiest group, somebody from one of those clans that need to replenish their people could step in and sometimes physically go in front of somebody trying to strike you and save you. Literally pull you back from being beaten to death and save you and begin the process of making you part of their tribe. So you would think, well, this is the luckiest group, first of all, but that person who just got saved, there's just an automatic trigger in your brain called Stockholm Syndrome or whatever you want. You're gonna cling to that person. That person's the most important person in the world to you now. Not only did they save your life, now they're, they're beginning to accept you. I'm going to go on a tangent at this point, and I have many, many tangents. As you know, if you've been listening all along, we're, uh, what, we're like 29 minutes in. So does this sound familiar? Uh, a Native American capturing somebody and going to strike them down, and then somebody rushes in, somebody from a clan, a female, to save the poor person about to be killed? Doesn't this sound like the story of John Smith and Pocahontas? Native Americans have argued this for a very long time, and historians have picked up onto it, and it, it seems to be the, it's the growing consensus that John Smith, when he was about to be killed by Powhatan and then miraculously saved by Pocahontas, if that event happened at all, John Smith was probably being adopted into the tribe. That was, that, that was what was actually happening there. And I believe John Smith even talks about hanging out with the Powhatan Indians, how they're like, oh, they just, you know, they call me brother and they hang out with me and they treat me like I'm one of them. That's because they thought, <laughs> they thought you were one of them and you just don't understand what's going on around you. The culture is completely different. So that whole Pocahontas story might just be a, an adoption ceremony that John Smith didn't understand. Tangent over. Now, from this luckiest group, things could turn at any minute. You would go through, like, fraternities call it a, a pledging time or a rushing time. You'd go through a very similar period where you were saved by a clan. You're part of this village now, part of this tribe, but you're not a full member yet. You're, you're not quite with everybody else. You're in this trial period. So the family that took you in, they could decide, you know, I like this person. They seem to be getting along with everybody. Let's make this permanent. And after a number of the timeline is never really clear. I mean, you could be very charming, it's three months, or it could take 10 years, you'd be made a full member. And that's a full member in every sense of the word. You're part of the clan now, you can marry whoever you want, you can be part of the political process. You can even become a sachem, it happened. Or at any point, that clan, the member who took you on could, could decide, you know what, my grief cannot be tamed. This man, or this woman, is part of that tribe that killed my husband, killed my grandma, killed somebody, and this person is just not replacing them for me. And at any moment, they could kill you. Reports vary, but as a captive, they, your life was forfeit to them. In a moment's notice, they could just decide to kill you on the spot, no discussion. And then at other times, you would pretty much know you were going to be killed. And they would have kind of a celebration and all of a sudden, you are like the sacrificial lamb, and then they kill you at the end of it. So that's going to take us from our luckiest scenario to the unluckiest scenario. In between, we have that group that people really aren't sure about. So if you were part of that middle group where they're like, I don't know if this, this person's going to be adoptable into our tribe, you would have to run the gauntlet. People would watch you to see if you were a brave person. If you fell into the gauntlet, it was over for you. They're going to beat you to death. You make it through the gauntlet, you prove you're strong. You're not in that select group of people who are gonna be adopted right off the bat. But if you show yourself to be a person who was brave enough and desirable in some way, they'd say, you know what, let's give them a try. And then you'd enter that trial period we just talked about. Then there's other scenarios where if you show you're very brave, well then you're going to be the uh, pick of the litter for torture. It's all dependent on the moods of the people at the time. So let's get into that unluckiest group a little bit. And again, some of the more gruesome details you'll find in that previous episode. So you're uh, in the torture group. Now this is some gruesome stuff, and this is the 17th century. You're gonna find stuff like this everywhere in the world at this time. It's just a more primitive time for everyone. Doesn't matter your race, religion, creed, nationality, what? Everybody was more primitive back then. 
The first tortures were less severe, obviously. They would start they would start off easy, so to speak, easy. Usually they would start at the extremities, the fingertips, the nails especially. They'd pull out your nails, they'd put little, little slivers of wood underneath the nails and they'd rip them back. Imagine how painful that is. You have so many nerve endings there. And then there are even reports of people having their fingers bit off, cut off, bitten down to the bone. And the Iroquois, they would cauterize wounds that were bleeding too much in order to keep you alive longer. So the torture lasted longer. And in some cases you would be tortured and eventually they would adopt you. So either way, they would stop the bleeding you, if they could. And then the tortures would get slowly worse and the Iroquois tried as much as possible to drag out these tortures. And now if you were a European, let's say, and you were captured and you were undergoing these tortures, it would be just utterly just horrifying. You'd have no understanding of what was happening and beyond that you're being tortured to death. Now if you were a Native American, you might have a better understanding of, of the process going on. Now during this time, if you were a Native American and you were being tortured to death, you would have an urge inside of you to show great courage. Now there's little debate over why you'd be showing great courage. One thing is that you are, this is the last thing you're going to be doing or last thing that's going to be happening to you as a living human being. To go out with courage was a great sign of your power that was within you. And then on the other hand, you have people who are a little more pessimistic about what's going on here, I'd say. And just showing courage was a way of saying, you're not affecting me. You're not hurting me as much as you think you are. I'm already beyond you. Either way, the Native Americans would typically show as much courage as possible during their torture. And the torturers would give them a, a sort of respect for being able to withstand so much pain. It would serve as a sort of entertainment and ritual and everything all mixed up together. And one important note to understand this, this strange concept to us is that there was every living thing had a power in it, according to most Native, Americans group, Native American groups. And that power could be seen in various ways. Now, courage being one of the, the best ways to show power as a human being. The people torturing you, they would like to see that power because they're going to have various ways of absorbing that power. They're going to kill you. You are going to be sacrificed for some crime your tribe committed or to, to compensate for someone they lost. And so they're going to kill you or, you know, one of your tribe. And you have a certain amount of power in you and they're going to try to take that power. So as the tortures progressed, you might find yourself losing limbs, your hair is gone, your nails are ripped out, your teeth are ripped out, you're being beaten occasionally, children would throw coals on you as you were like stretched between wooden frames, and then eventually the killing would happen. They would sometimes burn you to death, chop your head off, put an axe through your head, scalp you while you were alive. There, there was a lot of different things that could happen to you. The most famous case of torture is probably Isaac Yogues. You might have heard his name before, but Isaac Yogues. Yogues? Am I saying it right or Jogues? I'm pretending like he's German or something. It's J O J O Q U E S. That's not Yogues. Jock? Isaac Jock? I have no idea. But anyway, there was a Jesuit priest named Isaac Jogues. I'm going to go with that. Now, he, of course, was among the, uh, the Huron, originally, to convert them to Catholicism. And that's why we're going to see Jesuits inside and outside of our stories in this period and the time afterwards. The Jesuits are set on converting Native Americans. The Jesuits are going to develop reputations for going long periods of time without food, being able to travel over long distances. They're really tough guys. And unlike other religious orders that might have had dealings with the Portuguese and the Spanish that you might learn about in uh, Latin American history, the Jesuits, they wanted to convert the Native Americans, but the, the priests themselves, the missionaries, they didn't want to control them to the point of creating a colonial empire. So the French, they want to be trade allies with the Huron, they want to have friendly relations, they want to share the same religion. But they're never looking to dominate their Native American allies in the same way the English were and the Spanish and the Portuguese. So the Jesuits, even though they're on the other side of our story right now, 
they're not the bad guys. If you could boil down history to good guys and bad guys, the Jesuits would be on the good side. They want to convert you. And usually they're not going to kill you in order to do it. They're not going to force you. They want to be your friend. They want to trade with you. And they want to persuade you. And so the best records we have of Native Americans at this time come from the Jesuits because they really wanted to understand different Native American cultures in order to find ways that they could persuade you to become a Christian, a Catholic specifically. Isaac Jogues was one of those guys. I'm going to do a whole episode on them when we get to New France, which will be two seasons from now, I believe. So I'm going to briefly cover his life here. Does not end well. Isaac Jogues, this Jesuit priest, he goes off to convert the Huron, and the Huron and the Huron allies. Eventually, he gets captured by the Haudenosaunee. The Mohawks specifically, I believe. And he's captured with another priest. Now, one of the first tortures he goes to is that his fingers are cut into and bitten down to the bone. And a woman cuts one of his thumbs off, at least. His hands are utterly ruined. And then in his captivity, because he's captive with all these other Native Americans whom he's, he has known before his captivity, they were captured with him, he was still preaching to them, still trying to convert them, or if they were converted, just tend to them. And the Mohawk would starve him and burn him and, again, take off his extremities. And this went on far longer than what we see for the typical Native American captive. This wasn't one ceremony or one long marathon of torture. This was months and months. It's likely they didn't know what to do with Isaac. He was a, you know, a French man. He had some understanding of Native American culture, but he was preaching this new religion uh, involving spirits that they did not really know about, but might have some power to them. There was a lot of unknowns with him. He was clearly in that unknown group. So anyway, he goes through these various tortures, and eventually the Dutch at Fort Orange, they get wind that there's a Jesuit priest who's been held captive. And they try to bargain for the guy. Even though the French and the Dutch, they're enemies, there's a commonality there when it comes to the New World. Well, you know, the Dutch are going to be Protestant, the French are going to be Catholic. But in comparison to what the Native Americans going on, the Dutch can see a commonality of, okay, well, we're, we're Christians and something's happening to this man and he didn't do anything to us. And he's a man of God, sort of. We should do something about this. Eventually, and again, I'm going to cover this in way more, more depth, depth in a future season. Eventually, he is part of a, he's basically a servant to the Mohawk and he's helping carry goods to Fort Orange and he escapes. He's convinced by the Dutch to make an escape. He hides out in a couple places, a barn and a boat, and eventually the Mohawk go home and he's free. The Dutch actually drop him off in France and he is so mutilated that the Pope himself declares Isaac a living martyr. Think about that. A martyr is somebody who died for their religion. He was so mutilated that he was considered already there. He's living, but he's also dead. He's, he's a walking dead. He's a dead man walking. This guy was beyond repair. Uh, again, his own religion looked at him and said, you're, you're already dead. You're already, you're less than a living human. You've already done the sacrifice. Martyrdom is something that would be an honor for a Jesuit priest. There's other orders where martyrdom is more of, a, of an honor, but being a martyr is, is a high honor, if you think about it. it. It's kind of an odd concept. I, you know, I don't want to be brutally murdered, but if I'm remembered as a martyr, what more, what better thing for me in my spirit? So Isaac was in this in-between, a living martyr. What is that? What is a living martyr? And he eventually felt guilty. Can you imagine? Guilty that he got away from the Mohawk. Put yourself into his shoes where your whole purpose for going there is to spread religion, spread religion to the New World, to the Native American groups. You're captured by the Mohawk. They're Native Americans too. They're people who haven't heard Jesus' message yet. You could have saved them. You could have stayed with them. There might have been a chance. Or you could have died spreading God's word. Instead, you took this other route where you're just a dead man walking. What is that? So Isaac actually goes back. And he's content with the fact that he might become a legitimate martyr through this. And I believe he becomes a, a diplomat of sorts 
from New France to the Mohawk. He goes back. He goes back to the Mohawk. And there are some items associated. The, the, there's different varieties of, of this story. But there are some items associated with the Jesuits that were left there in the Mohawk villages. And shortly thereafter, there was a, an outbreak of smallpox. And the Native Americans, rightly so, blamed those objects for the spreading of the disease. They didn't have germ theory, but they were right in thinking that it was this contact that caused this disease. So when Isaac shows back up in Mohawk country, I think he's, he's there a day or two. And then eventually, a Mohawk warrior puts a stone axe in the back of his head and dumps his body into a creek. And that's the end of the story of Isaac Jogues. He finally became a legitimate martyr. Now let's contrast this to his buddy, the other Jesuit priest, way back at the beginning of the story, who was also captured with him. During the same time period, I imagine going through some of the same tortures, by the time Isaac comes back around, this guy, this other priest, has been adopted into the tribe. He's been able to help spread the religion. I'll just remind you today that among the Mohawk, I, I believe Catholicism is the most predominant religion, thanks to this guy. And he's achieved power, actual political power. He becomes a sachem. So this would be unheard of in basically any other Native American system or European system or anywhere else. He went from captive to sachem in a period of, I, I don't know, three years? Not even? Remarkable. So in this story, you could see the power of the Haudenosaunee culture and being able to replenish itself. I could take you from a captive and put you at the top level of our confederacy in three years. You just got to show me you got the right stuff. And in this case, it wasn't even another Native American cousin, another Iroquois people, or just another Native American in Algonquin. It's a white guy from France. So they were welcoming and, and they were accommodating if you were the right, if you had the stuff they were looking for. So what is that stuff? Well, do you have a good personality? Can you learn the language quickly? Are you a good hunter? If you're a woman, are you good at farming? Are you good at making textiles? Do you get along with everybody again? One big thing you could do to earn a lot of respect is to go to war against your, your original family, your original tribe, or your original, original settlement if you were a white person. That, I mean, you, as you can imagine, that would earn somebody instant respect and instant trust. But let's suppose you took the route of Isaac and you were finally killed after many, many tortures. Well, they're, they're not done with you quite yet. Your blood is a source of power to, to the Native American mm, cosmology, you could say. And everywhere else in the world at this time and before, blood has a special spiritual meaning in every religion. If you look at Christianity, blood is, is one of the ways that mm, Jesus is covenant with you. Jesus' uh, grace is, is given onto you. His forgiveness can be transmitted through his symbolic blood. And that goes back square in a Jewish tradition where blood is, is basically God's liquid. That's why it needs to be drained from meat in kosher laws. Because blood is, is the thing that gives you spirit, gives you movement, gives you life. And what, what could possibly be the source of that spirit, movement, life, that blood? It would be God. So blood is sacred all around the world in Christianity and Judaism and as we see here in the Native American cultures. That blood in the Iroquois culture would be a source of power. And so the blood would be drunk or rubbed on the body, like a similar to a smudging ceremony that would be done with tobacco. And that was a way of absorbing that power, that spiritual power, that courage that the victim had displayed before they died. So the village could also replenish itself, not just with members, but through the tortured and the killed captives, just power in general. But then they'd have to deal with the issue of your spirit. And this, again, you could find in any culture. You kill somebody, their spirit might linger like an Edgar Allan Poe story. And so after they had killed any amount, one or a whole group of captives that they decided to torture and then kill, they would, at night, have a big fire and they'd get sticks and all sorts of noisemakers and they'd bang on the longhouses and they would try to scare away your spirit so you wouldn't create any sort of negative energy that would hang over the village, any sort of curse, anything like that. This is similar to uh, the, the idea of Halloween, the idea of scaring away an evil spirit. So a lot of cultures have this too. Or even old, you know, Mediterranean Christian traditions of throwing different things over your shoulder to scare away the devil or... Things like that. The idea is you want to get those bad spirits away from you. It's a very human impulse. 
So if you do find yourself in the 17th century captured by the Haudenosaunee, those are the different avenues for you. And you have some control over which way you go. So it's not an open and closed book. There, there, is, there is some hope for you if you find yourself in that century. Also, after all these plagues start to set in, as you can imagine, the need for more people would cause there to be less and less torture. Did I successfully argue that the Beaver Wars weren't really the Beaver Wars? Are you convinced yet? Well, I have a quote here from Isaac Jokes. Jokes, whatever his name is. The Jesuit priest Isaac, I have a quote from him here. And this is about the, what we're gonna talk about next, the Iroquois moving in to the Huron territory and all their allies. Isaac Yogues says this, it is the design of the Iroquois to capture all of the Huron. If it is possible to put the chiefs and the great part of the nation to death and with the rest form one nation and one country. That's a beautiful quote, there it is. A man right from the 17th century telling you, yeah, they're gonna kill a lot of people, but it, their aim, their goal is to create a unity to create one nation. Now he's not 100% correct in his analysis, but in there is that impulse to bring the people together rather than to take over people, create an empire, or kill everyone so we can get to the beaver fur. Now let's get into some of the nitty gritty, the events that actually occurred, these so-called beaver wars that happened. So after the Mohawk Mohegan War, 1624 to 1628, we see that there are small skirmishes. We're talking about individual people in the records, sometimes a dozen people, couple dozen. But in the spring of 1634, we see an event here where the Huron were actually planning to attack the Seneca. So as much as this time period is shaded with, oh, the Mohawk and the rest of the Haudenosaunee were expanding outward and they were the aggressors. Here we are, 1634, the Huron are planning to attack the Seneca. So the Huron are going into Seneca territory with 500 warriors. That's a lot more in number than we see before this point. And then the Seneca somehow find out about this. They get tipped off early and they're able to organize themselves. And they gather together 1,500 warriors to go against these 500 Huron. And just sheer numbers game here, it was an outright slaughter of the Huron. 200 were killed and 100 captured. After this period, there's a number of small skirmishes happening between the Haudenosaunee and then various Algonquin tribes, a lot of them to the east. Now, if these wars were all over beavers, there'd be no reason to go east. Beavers have already been picked off as far as you go east. You need to go west and you need to go north to find new beaver grounds. So all these various attacks against Algonquin peoples to the east and those people attacking the Haudenosaunee, there had to be other motives. It couldn't have necessarily been over beaver. We know the Mohegan were still around. They were not wiped out by the Mohawk. They were pushed back to the other side of the Hudson. And so they continued to go back and forth with each other for some time. And in fact, John Winthrop, a Puritan and one of the founders of the Massachusetts Bay Company, he records seeing the Iroquois going off on the attack in Connecticut territory, or what would one day become Connecticut. So again, if this was about beavers, the Iroquois are going off in the wrong direction. Clearly other motives are at work. The Iroquois battles with the Algonquin people seem to be these small skirmish types, but let's take you back to their cousins, the Huron, right? 1637, now we have 500 Iroquois warriors moving into Huron territory. Again, they attack the Huron far differently than they attack Algonquins. So they go in with 500 warriors, and the result is they only kill one person in this attack. It's in August of 1637, they only kill one Huron, and they capture 30. So what does that tell you? They capture 30 Huron. They kill one. Jose Brandau, in his reading of the Jesuit relations, which is the original source for this attack, says that there might have been some goods taken. But it's clear from the text that pillaging was not the focus of this raid. They didn't go there to get material things. They went there to get captives to replenish their population. Again, 50 to 90% of them wiped out by plagues, in a, in a series of plagues, rather. Things are beginning to intensify now in the West between the Iroquois and their cousins. So we don't have very many records for what happens next after 1636. The next year is kind of murky because the Jesuits just weren't among the tribes that we're gonna look at here. But the Wenro, who are another Iroquois people, but not in the Confederacy, the Wenro are forced by the Iroquois to abandon 
all of their lands. Abandon their lands and basically their identity, and the Wenro are forced to go and live, the survivors, with the Huron. Now from this, we don't exactly know how many of the Wenro were taken captive or killed, because the records are murky. But we know there was this sudden influx of the remainder of the tribe into the Huron. So the Wenro territory is now occupied by the Five Nations. This is 1637 into 1638. Again, we don't know exactly when. During the same period, in the east, to the east of the Haudenosaunee, the Pequot War was going on in what is now New England, between various Native American alliances involving the English. Now, it's known that the Iroquois were involved somehow, and that they, were, they had various victories. The Jesuits record them, but it's very vague. We don't know exactly what was going on, but we know all this stuff going on in the west. They were also over on the east, make, making headway among the Algonquin people. But the Iroquois are still suffering from various raids from other people. We see in 1638, it says right here about the fall of 1638, we have 300 Huron and some Algonquin allies going back into Iroquois territory. And the Iroquois actually suffer a huge loss there. Shortly after this point, we see a period of blood feuds, small scale encounters between various tribes of the Huron Confederacy and the Iroquois Confederacy, trying to avenge the deaths of loved ones and family members. We see during this period of the 1630s that slowly the Huron are becoming less and less safe where they are, less and less comfortable in their position. Same thing with some Algonquin tribes. And the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee specifically, are becoming more powerful, more influential. They're having a larger reach and it's happening very slowly. Now, one of the secrets to this slow building of success is somehow during the 1630s, it's in its unknown when or where exactly this happened, the Iroquois start getting firearms. Now, it's unknown when this happened exactly, but we talked about this in the last New Netherland episode because clearly the English are not selling the Iroquois weapons. The French certainly are not selling the Iroquois weapons. It has to be the Dutch, but it was against official Dutch policy to do so. So in the 1630s, most of it anyway, it had to be private traders illegally selling weapons to the Haudenosaunee, specifically the Mohawk. Some sources even point out that by the mid 1630s, the Iroquois, the Mohawk specifically again, have firearms that are top of the line and brand new and manufactured in the Netherlands. So the Iroquois were perceptive buyers. So going against that common misconception that the Native Americans were innocent and naive and weren't sure how to trade or when they were being duped it's very clear that the mohawk were like oh we want those guns those guns are the good ones so we know they were getting guns we know they were top of the line and we know they were dutch based on the records now historians have pointed out there's probably one figure who fits the profile best for being the guy who supplied these guns or at least was the bigger biggest supplier of these guns illegally to the mohawk and that would be arndt van curler or van curler He's the founder of Schenectady. He's another nephew of old man Van Ren, who we mentioned before. His family's all over this story. What better guy to smuggle guns to the Mohawk? We know he set up the town of Schenectady many decades after this. And that was closer to Mohawk territory than any other settlement. And he did that on purpose. We know he had a child with a Mohawk woman. We know he knew the language. We know he's been there for decades. And in fact, decades from now, when the English take over, at a certain point, they're going to accuse him of inciting the Mohawk to violence or supplying them weapons. It's going to happen again. This is our guy because he shows up in the 1630s. Boom. He shows up. All of a sudden, the Mohawk get weapons. How did that happen? Well, again, he's Van Ren's nephew. Who better to smuggle weapons illegally through New Netherland territory than a company man who has connections to the biggest investors in the company and can grease the palms of anyone he's not exactly allied with to look the other way. This was probably the guy who did it. And again, this is also one of the guys who were dealing with the Mohawk when Isaac Yogues was one of their captives and he helped, he got Jogues out of there. He stole him basically, <laughs> he retrieved him. But in all this time period, only one person was ever convicted of selling weapons to the Mohawk. And that was a trader named Michael Jans. And I can't find much about this guy, but I would suspect he has some connection to the Van Ren family and to Arndt Van Curler. So the Iroquois are now starting to get firearms, which no other Native American group at this time has. But it's a small supply and it's not a reliable supply. It can get cut off at any point in time and you always need a supply of powder because 
without powder, how, the guns are basically sticks. So even with the unsteady supply, this period of time shifts the Hendenoshone from being on the defense to being comfortable and occasionally taking offensive wars. And even with the plagues and the devastation, we see that the influx of European goods is changing the lifestyle of the Iroquois. By 1641, the Iroquois are receiving tribute from various Algonquin tribes to the east of them in what's going to be New England. The reverse for some Haudenosaunee tribes used to be true. They used to be giving up tribute to other tribes, Algonquin tribes. Now it's coming back their way. So that's good for them. We know that they had more leisure time. One way archaeologists have determined to find out how much basic free time uh, culture has is how ornate, how decorated, how artful are their crafts or their just regular things they use for utility. So one example among the Iroquois are their pipes. So during this period, we see their pipes becoming more colorful, more decorated, more sculpted, more ornate, bigger. So they're actually less, less, uh, less portable. This is how we know they had more time on their hands because they're spending more time on art, which as valuable as it is, is not, you know, food, water, shelter, defense. It's something else. So the Dutch goods are actually saving them a lot of time. As you can imagine, we'll go with pipes. A good, well-made Dutch pipe is gonna last a long time compared to the Native American versions that were made previously. And so you have to make a pipe less often. That saves you time. That's a very small example. Much better example, think of farm tools. All right, metal farm tools. So before the Dutch came around, the Iroquois didn't have access to metal tools unless they pillaged them from somebody trading with the French or maybe sometimes even the English. Now, imagine you're a farmer of some sort and you don't have a metal shovel. What are you digging with? Just think of how much more time it would take to do that. And so basically metal farm tools are going to save hundreds, maybe even thousands of hours for a... Uh, a female Haudenosaunee member out in the fields. And those kind of conveniences were going to trickle down into every portion of Iroquois life at this time. Sped up even more so by the fact that again, 50 to 90% of your members are dying off. And again, they're your encyclopedia of knowledge. The knowledge of how to do things the old way are going away and you're, ado you're adopting the Dutch way simply out of necessity because your library is dying. The knowledge is being lost. The downside of this is now you become dependent on that supply from the Dutch. Rather than going, oh, neat, we have this access to all this new stuff, and we're a complete and whole culture by ourselves who can take care of ourselves, now they're dependent on one another. The Haudenosaunee are connected to this transatlantic trade world, and now they can't be separated from it easily. They need it to survive, well, not survive, but have the quality of life that they have at that current time. It's no surprise then that the Haudenosaunee moved to make that bond between them and the Dutch even deeper. So in 1642, they have a chain of friendship treaty. Of course, there's a wampum version and then there would be a written version and the Iroquois would take their wampum and the Dutch would take their written version, but it's an agreed upon treaty, 1642, and it's bringing that, that chain connecting them even closer together. Because that's what the Haudenosaunee needs. This is another example of Native Americans taking an initiative, going out and getting what they want, rather than the English putting treaties upon the Native Americans. We see here, like, the Native Americans, the Haudenosaunee, are approaching the Dutch and saying, hey, let's draw ourselves closer together. Again, the 17th century is full of all sorts of things you're not going to see in the 18th, 19th, 20th century. And this 1642 treaty, it's the first documented treaty that we have between the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee. Of course, in Haudenosaunee oral tradition, they refer to much earlier treaties, and we've talked about those. This is the first one where we've got the paper. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's the very first one, but it was an escalation of the connection between the two peoples. Now remember, the Iroquois did not consider the Dutch to be full members of the Confederacy. The Iroquois looked at the Dutch as children in some ways because they didn't have the manners. They didn't understand the customs. And so they were like a child. They were going to do things that would be considered morally or ethically or just just um, socially unacceptable. They were not uh, housebroken in a sense. So as much as they were bonded to one another, they still kept each other at arm's length. In fact, the Mohawk kind of referred to the Dutch as just metal, metal workers. They just called them the makers of metal or the creators of metal because that's kind of what they saw them as. There was always that distance there, which served actually to maintain a peace because they weren't overlapping territory and getting in each other's business. 
So they have some firearms, they got a stronger relation with a European power, you think they would just be exploding outward. According to the Beaver War theory, they would be. They'd be going out to make a great empire. Well, the year 1645 would probably prove you wrong. Because again, there's lots of little skirmishes. But that year, we see that the Mohawk are actually arranging a peace treaty between the various Algonquin tribes and the Dutch, who are warring with each other in downstate New York, just south of Haudenosaunee territory. And so the Mohawk are actually coming in, and rather than wiping out the Algonquins for having uh, bad relations with their allies, the Dutch, they're trying to mediate between the two. So this is not the behavior of an empire-making culture. They're not savagely taking over territories just for the, the fun of it. Also, in that same year, we see that the Haudenosaunee, various tribes inside of there anyway, are trying to make peaceful relations with the French and their Native American allies. So to the north and to the south, 1645, there's a lot of overtures of peace anyway. Here's another unexpected thing of the Haudenosaunee in the 1640s. They started acquiring the skills of metal making. So not just taking European metal objects and scraping them and bending them into traditional Native American objects like arrowheads. They're actually making molds and they're melting metal and turning it into objects all of their own. So 30 years before this, the Haudenosaunee and basically most Native Americans would have been what we call in the old world so Europe, Asia, Africa, the Mesolithic Age. You're between the Old Stone Age and the New Stone Age. You hunt and gather, but you're also doing a lot of farming. Your settlements are semi-permanent to almost completely permanent. And so that's right there in the middle, Mesolithic. And in 30 years, they're already up to the Iron Age. Think about that. Technologically, they go from Stonehenge to classical Greece in 30 years. Very impressive. Now to the outside world, the Native Americans who lived around them, the Iroquois were becoming a bigger and bigger threat. We saw these small raids that we talked about, and the toll of them were starting to affect the psyche of all these various Huron, uh, Iroquois outside of the Haudenosaunee, and Algonquin tribes that surround what is now New York. In the Jesuit relations, they record a number of of different incidents and different mindsets of people living in these French controlled areas where they were converting natives to Catholicism and their fear of the Iroquois. The Iroquois became the boogeyman for them. I have one example here from the 1640-1641 relations. Uh, here we go. Every day and every night they have visions. They see, so they say, the Iroquois behind their corn. They see them in the woods. They see canoes floating. They see them lying still. They see those that pursue them. They observe attentively the tracks of their enemies on the sand. They identify the place where they have slept, the trees from which they have gathered fruit. They even hear them yelling in the depth of the forest. They have given a thousand false alarms to our Frenchmen. The neighbors of the Haudenosaunee are scared. Again, right from the quote, it's the boogeyman. The Iroquois aren't even there. And these people are just, they're hearing noises. Oh, is that the Iroquois? Are they coming now? Are they around the corner? Are they coming to get me? Are they going to get my children? Now that's in their own homes. We see that the French native allies were even afraid to travel now because of the Iroquois. Here's another quote from the same relations. The boast of the Iroquois made us suspend its execution. We are not men of war. We handle the paddle better than the javelin. We love peace. That is why we keep as far away as possible from occasions for fighting. If we could overcome these people who wish to massacre us, we would very soon be near you, for we have a great desire to be instructed. Now this is in response to a missionary saying, hey, come over here, we'll teach you about Jesus, and we'll convert you to Catholicism. These native people are saying, we can't, we're, not, we're not going to your settlement. We're scared. We're not leaving our territory. Not at all. And here's another example from the same relations. And I just randomly opened one of the relations from this period. So this is a, a one to two year period right here. So uh, here is where a missionary is trying to conduct a baptism. All right. Uh, I had appointed this day for a baptism, but an alarm about the Iroquois coming on this very day caused the people to flee immediately into the country. And he, the one who was going to be baptized with him, fearing those warriors more dangerous than demons. We have less records of what's going on with the Algonquins wedged between the New England colonies and the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee. So they're going to be right there at the edge of New England with the English to their east and the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee to their west. And what we see in the Jesuit relations that recorded way out in what's now Canada, 
parts of Quebec and parts of now what is Ottawa, that Algonquins from areas that we would call Connecticut today or Massachusetts are ending up at Huron settlements. So they're fleeing to the Huron for safety. And again, they have good relations with each other generally. The Huron were very good at, at diplomatic relations, but culturally the Algonquin and the Huron, their languages aren't even related to one another. That's how desperate the Algonquin are becoming. And as we just saw the Huron, they're feeling it too. The other French allies, they're feeling it too. Nobody's feeling safe. And they're right to feel like they're in danger. I think I mentioned it before, but some of these tribes, the, the, the various Algonquin people, the various Huron people, other Iroquois people not in the Confederacy, they're either going to disappear or we're going to find some remnant of them all the way up in Wisconsin or sometimes in the deep south a couple hundred years from this period. So stuff is about to go down. And what is going to be the event that is going to send everything into a tailspin and cause the Iroquois to expand outward and Huronia to basically fall off the face of the earth? It's going to be the Dutch formally legalizing the sale of weapons from the Dutch West India Company directly to the Iroquois Confederacy. It's not enough that they had guns. Now they're going to have a steady, consistent supply of weapons. And for the other Native American tribes who have no access to these weapons, because even though they have European allies, very few firearms are being exchanged. It's usually against policy. It's going to be like literally bringing a knife to a gunfight. That's exactly what it's going to be like. And we know how that turns out. I have it written down here. Looks like March 7th, 1648. Stuyvesant receives a letter from his bosses in the Dutch West India Company, and it authorizes him to sell guns to the Mohawk Indians. This is it. Stuff's going to start moving very quickly now. Again, we saw the Wenro abandon their territory to join the Huron. Now, right on the cusp of obtaining this steady supply of guns, even some tribes in the Huron Confederacy are starting to abandon their territory, and they're starting to move even further west, further out, away from the Iroquois. We see this in 1647. But here we are in that magical year, 1648. In that year, the Mohawk and the Senecas, they go after a tribe in the Huron Confederacy. I'm not gonna dare try to say the name of it. It's very long, it starts with an A, you can look it up. But I'm not gonna insult the people by trying to say that name because I just, I can't, frankly. They capture 700 people. Clearly, this is not about beaver. They capture 700 people. Again, before this, we see a dozen guys fight a dozen guys. And every now and then you see a hundred guys. We talked about one time where we saw over a thousand. Boom, here we have 700 people captured. This clearly shows an escalation of the efforts. A year after this point in time, some of those captives are now warriors with the Seneca and the Mohawk having been adopted. And they go back and attack their own tribe. You can imagine the psychological toll of being attacked by your own brothers from the year before. Heronia. This huge confederacy, the granary of the Algonquins, allied with the French, a place of safety for the Native Americans in those tribes, uh, more so than anywhere else in this part of North America, is now clearly been breached and is on the decline. Less than a year later, in the early spring of 1649, having guns for about a year at this point, the Iroquois are back in Huron territory, over a thousand of them. They attack two Huron villages, and they take 630 people captive. More and more throughout this year and the next, the battles are not taking place in Huronia, and then inside of the Confederacy. It's all happening in Huronia. The attacks are outward. The Iroquois are coming. They're showing up. They're relentless. Just when you think they're gone, they're coming back again from another tribe. Tribe after tribe of the Haudenosaunee are pushing into Huronia, and it is eroding very quickly. Now, in this last attack that we talked about, the Iroquois are starting to display different abilities in warfare. They're starting to advance their theory of combat, so to speak. The historian George T. Hunt, he pointed out three things about this battle specifically and how it changes things going forward. It was the first time there was an all-out war in what was still the winter time. Even though it was, it was early March, it was, there was still ice on the ground. The numbers were much larger than what we've seen before, at least a great majority of the time. And the third thing, by the accounts that the Jesuits have written down, they were extremely organized. More organized than they've ever been before. And the effects of this one attack started to really push things over the edge. So they took a whole bunch of captives, and the ones who would not go willingly, or the ones that they couldn't take with them, they burned them to death. So that's quite a scary thing for the other Huron to hear about. 
and then the people in those Huron villages abandoned the villages. Those two villages were abandoned. Some of those people feeling so hopeless actually willingly went, walked into Iroquois territory and joined the Iroquois. Other ones retreated and tried to get French help. And the Jesuits tried to do their best to feed everyone. But many of these people ended up dying, freezing to death or starving to death over the following season. Now you might say to yourself, how did these people starve to death? They're in a confederacy. Weren't there people there to help the couple dozen survivors or the couple hundred survivors? No, because mostly the Mohawk and the Seneca, the two ends of the longhouse, were in Huronia destroying everything. Right before this, the Huron set out to the east and south to meet up with the Susquehannock and Iroquois people south of the Confederacy. They were going to strike up an alliance with one another surrounding the Haudenosaunee. But the Iroquois intercepted those diplomats and that arrangement was never made. The Susquehannock, not knowing where to meet up, not knowing where to attack or when to attack, left the Huron open for a complete annihilation. By May of the very same year, the Huron, out of pure fear, abandoned 15 of their villages. 15 villages. They burned them to the ground. Now, it's hard to know the population of Huronia, especially during this year, where a lot of things were going down. But some estimates say that in the 1620s, Huronia had 42, 45,000 people in it. And then even with the, the diseases ravaging everything, by the 1640s, they had around 10,000 people. Again, they didn't take a census. So it'd be very hard to know the exact amount. But imagine any size population losing 15 settlements. Imagine if we just randomly gave away 15 U.S. cities or towns or villages or hamlets to Canada. That'd be a big deal. You'd hear about that. People would be outraged. So here we are in Huronia, which might only have 10,000 people after all these diseases ravaged the population. And they abandoned 15 settlements. Now, an Iroquois settlement... Well, again, because they're an Iroquois people, although they're not part of the Haudenosaunee, might have 20 longhouses, 10 longhouses. There's some variability there. But let's say, on average, 150, 180 people. Multiply that by 15. That's a big chunk of your population if you only have 10,000 people. The country is eroding. And the Huron know that. They burn their villages. They know they're not coming back. They know it's over. The nation is in full-on retreat. And by the end of that year, 1649, Huronia is completely destroyed. It is gone. Every tribe in that confederacy, which for a good amount of the time we've talked about so far was bigger than the Iroquois confederacy, is gone. Everyone is scattered. Everyone is running for their lives. Some are running to the French, but the French population at this time, believe it or not, in New France was only about 300, 400 people. They're running to allies further out west, the few that they have left. But Huronia, as a political entity, the granary of the Algonquins, this huge confederacy, in 1649 is gone. Thousands of people being absorbed by the Iroquois confederacy. The people who weren't killed or died from the conditions and still managed to keep some semblance of their culture. We today call them the Wyandotte people. And there's a number of different tribes. And they don't have a confederacy anymore. And they're spread out all over the North American continent. There's one group in Quebec. There's other groups in the United States as far away as Oklahoma. And then there's unrecognized tribes in places like Kansas. At the end of the day, the Wyandotte people, the Huron, had to scatter themselves far, far, far away from Huronia to get away from the Iroquois. And then, of course, history, after this point, will not be favorable to Native Americans in general. So some of those people escaped to Wisconsin, basically. They went from Huronia on the one side of the Great Lakes to Wisconsin. And then the various forces of history pushed them even further out or further south. It's not a good story from this point on. 1649 is the year a balloon just burst. With Huronia gone, all these smaller tribes that were part of this fur trading network, part of this mutual assistance alliance with the Huron at the center of it, and the French at the head of it was broken. And now all these smaller tribes, which were protected by this larger network, are now going to have to deal with the Iroquois Confederacy all on their own. With the Wenros gone, and then the Huron gone, they moved further west, further north, and they came upon the neutrals, who always had a neutral relation between the Huron and the Iroquois Confederacy. Hence why they are referred to that. They didn't call themselves neutrals. But anyway, in the next year, 1650, the neutrals are 
dispersed in the same fashion. They're gone. We're seeing tribe after tribe disappear. And the neutrals disappear from history. They do not exist as a tribe. It's not like the Wyandotte where they end up a thousand miles away, but they're still kind of the same people. There's some remnant there. The neutrals are gone, absorbed. Absorbed by friendly tribes who took in people running away. The fugitives, not fugitives. What's the word I'm looking for? Refugees. And then absorbed by being captives to the Iroquois. In the same time period, the Iroquois Confederacy went after the Tobacco Nation, otherwise known as the Patoon Nation, another Iroquois-speaking people. And in 1649, by the end of the year, by December, had completely dispersed them also. All of their territory is gone. They flee to the West, and whatever little bit of them is left joins up with the Wyandotte, otherwise known as the Huron, fleeing to the West. And in the same exact time period, the Haudenosaunee go a little west and south, and they take on the Erie people, another Iroquois-speaking people, and wipe them out too. Now, by wiping out, I don't mean they killed all of them. As the records have shown, a lot of them were captives, and they were absorbed by the Haudenosaunee. They're going to their Iroquois-speaking cousins and absorbing them. So in a two-year period or so, by 1651, the middle of our continent has been forever changed. The entire Great Lakes region, the political layout of it, forever changed by the Iroquois, by the Confederacy. Before this period, the Huron are the major power brokers in the area, and they have their French allies to the northeast, and the entire middle of the continent trade more or less funnels through the Huron. They're part of a great alliance, and there's relative safety. Three years go by, now the Iroquois Confederacy, based in what is now upstate New York, has free reign to parts of Upper Canada. And again, if you want to avoid complications with the Iroquois, you have to go as far away as Wisconsin, or you have to go as far away in the other direction as the actual French settlements along the St. Lawrence. And the French themselves, in the huge territory of New France, were about to pack it in. They are on the edge of complete disaster. So the Iroquois, in this very small period of time where they obtained firearms, were able to disperse dozens of tribes. Because remember, the Huron were a confederacy of a bunch of tribes inside of that. Dozens of tribes, including this huge confederacy, and they nearly destroyed New France, not by directly attacking it, but by wiping out their entire trade network. Incredible. But this will not afford them safety for very long. Because this was only part one of the alleged Beaver Wars. This was the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis. Thank you for listening.